Okay, uh, colleagues, uh, we will now resume, starting with Group 10, uh, household, Householders' Duty of Care, etc. I call Amendment 11 in the name of Edward Mountain. Group with Amendments 56 and 57. Edward Mountain to move Amendment 11 and speak to all amendments in the group. Mr Mountain. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and I'd like to start by moving Amendment 11. Now, Amendment 11 came about as a result of some of the visits that the uh, committee undertook to look at the removal of household waste by operators. And it became entirely clear that uh, there were people out there who were not acting entirely in accordance with the law, and that householders were unclear whose responsibility it was to ensure that the person they had employed uh, to remove their waste, probably for a small charge, um, whether they had the correct licences. And it became also clear on the visit that we went up to at Bin Skips that a very simple way of that, doing that, was to display the licence on the outside of a van. Now, when we discussed this at stage two, the Minister was reticent about this because of the additional charges that would result. So I went to a local printer and ascertained how much an A3 vinyl sticker would be to go on the side of a van. I was told £40. Not a lot of money. And not a lot of money when the licence has to be applied through by SEPA and it could be easily added to the cost of that licence to ensure that, that uh, the sticker was displayed. So the householder would know exactly that the person who came to collect their waste, waste had a licence, uh, they wouldn't have to go any further than that, and uh, anyone then seeing waste being transported would know th that that person was a proper licensed operator. It sounds so simple. Why would you not like it? Well, I can't think of a reason why you wouldn't like it, which is why I'm removing it. I'm going to turn to Amendment 56. Now, initially, when I moved Amendment 56 at Stage 2, uh, the Minister was reticent about supporting this. This is uh, trying to come up with a household waste recycling plan that was the same across all of Scotland. Uh, and this is what this amendment attempts to do. And what it does in the first part is ask Scottish ministers to work with COSLA to prepare, pr prepare a household waste recycling plan. And then to provide uh, a colour recycling receptacles uh, across Scotland. Now, I'm not going to bore you with my chart, which I take with me, of course, wherever I go in Scotland, so I know which colour bin I am to put which bit of rubbish in, because it varies. Now, the most common bin is a blue bin. Mr Mountain, your prop is interfering ah, with your microphone. I've stopped the noise. The most common colour bin is a blue bin where you can put paper and cardboard, except, of, of course, if you're on the Isle of Lewis, where you have to put mis mixed recycling. And if you go to Arran, you have to put dry recycling. And then, of course, there's the grey bin, which is for paper and cardboard in Fife, whereas uh, Falkirk have burgundy bins for recycling. And then, if you go to Edinburgh, red box lids uh, would be for cans, in Aberdeen, because they're so different to Edinburgh, they have to have orange bins, uh, green bins in West Lothian, of course, purple bins in North Ayrshire, uh, and blue in Falkirk, which means complete mockery. And then just the final example I'd like to give, that brown bins in Murray, for example, are for garden waste, but in Eastern Bartonshire, they're for uh, plastic, glass and cans. Well, we seem to have worked out a way in Scotland of having 20 different recycling schemes spread amongst 32 councils. I hope the government, if they're not going to prepare or agree to this amendment, will prepare a chart so people, as they move around Scotland, know which bin they're going to put their recycling in. I would give way uh, to Mason. Mr Mason. John Mason. Uh, I wonder if the member would accept, I thank him for giving way, that uh, the Finance Committee looked at the financial memorandum, memorandum on this point and the cost of replacing all the bins and making the same all through Scotland would be quite horrendous. Edward Mayne. And of course I think Mr Mason is entirely right, which why is why my member addresses that and, and says that a plan must be drawn up with one, with, within one year of royal assent. And then the, the colour of the recycling receptacles are standardised, where possible, 
within a 10-year time frame. So as the bins come to the end of their life, you can, you can recycle them to make bins that are the same across all of Scotland. And, uh, you know, if local authorities can't manage to do that in 10 years without spending a huge amount of money, I'm not sure that I see we will ever get to the stage where we're recycling our waste. But if they can't do it in 10 years, my amendment uh, suggests that they, the Minister should come to Parliament and explain why it is. Look, it's really simple to, to come up with a standardised policy. Uh, I, sorry, I will give way, but the member might need to put your microphone up so I can hear you. Thank you very Jackie much. Dunbar. I wasn't intending to speak um, as normal, but it, I'm just... Um, through you, presiding officer, you were speaking about um, recycle bins needing replaced within 10 years. My recycle bin at home is my recycled former black bin, which is still ongoing, and we've had them now for at least 15 years. So they're still ongoing. So that that really would defeat the purpose a little bit, and it's not orange. Edward Mountain. And, and I have some sympathy with, with uh, the member's point, but of course, you know, I, I would say if you wanted to be clever, don't change the colour of the bin, change the colour of the lid to make it easier so every lid shows that. And that could easily be done in this if you came up with a plan. Now, I see I've inspired people's enthusiasm uh, on colours of bins across Scotland. Uh, I'll give way to Mr McPherson. Ben McPherson. Uh, does uh, Edward Mountain agree with me that the overarching point that we heard through our evidence, particularly at stage one of this bill, was that if we can improve the quality of the can we have your microphone up a bit? If we can improve the quality of the recycle it and therefore bring investment, then that will benefit the circular economy and the reuse of materials. And actually, rather than focusing on the colour of bins or the colour of lids depending on what happens through the, the procedure of these amendments, what we need to do collectively is improve understanding in communities across Scotland about what's recyclable and make sure that we improve that recycle to bring investment and change. Edward Main. And, Presiding Officer, of course I uh, agree with the member who is the Deputy Convener on the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee because he t speaks in entire sense, but if we don't know what bin we are putting the recyclet in, we are hardly likely to be able to improve the quality of it. I think I have made enough uh, song and dance about the colour of bins, eminently sensible to come up with a standard policy across Scotland, and I move Amendment 11 in my name and I will listen to the arguments, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Mountain. I call on Morris Golden to uh, speak to Amendment 57 and other amendments in the group. Mr Golden. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, amendment 57 is uh, an updated version from Stage 2 from me, which seeks to standardise the system uh, of uh, receptacles for collecting waste at household level across Scotland, with exceptions. So that could be the use of uh, stickers or bin lids so that consistent behaviour is achieved across the vast majority of Scotland. And it would help to stop the postcode lottery on recycling. But how that is achieved will be down to waste experts, which I think is important in this uh, matter rather than for the Scottish Parliament to decide on the system. Thank you. Thank you. And I call the Minister. Thank you, President Officer. Um, whilst I understand the intention um, of Edward Mountain in Amendment 11, which would impose a duty on licensed waste carriers to display their waste carrier's license number in their vehicle, I can't support it. Um, I would obviously support waste carriers doing this on a voluntary basis and agree that it might be good practice, but this amendment would be an impractical and costly burden on legitimate waste carriers who have to add this detail to the livery of their vehicles as they use in their business, including hire vehicles that may be used for a short period of time. Um, the duty of care code of practice for managing controlled waste <coughs> already contains guidance from householders 
to ensure that any household waste produced is only transferred to a, character, a carrier that is appropriate registered with SEPA. Now, we will continue to ensure that SEPA provides practical and accessible guidance um, when it's up, if, if you just let me finish this point, Mr. Lumsden, when it's updated to reflect changes made through the Circular Economy Bill. I have already, uh, off the back of uh, the exchanges that we had at stage two, reached out to SEPA to um, ask about this information being made more visible and accessible on the, uh, the, the literature and indeed the website that they have. And I'll take Mr Lumsden. Douglas Lumsden. Yeah, I thank the Minister for uh, taking the intervention. In terms of the waste carrier rules, would you agree that what we have in place just now isn't really working? Because I think most people don't realise that if they're given waste to someone, that they have to have a proper licence in place. And that's unknown to, I would say, most people in the population. Minister. So, hence, I think, is about the accessibility and visibility of this information. Now, uh, Mr Mountain comes at this from a particular uh, position where he thinks that uh, putting it on the, the vehicles would help. And I, and I don't have any kind of like major disagreement with the fact that having these uh, licence numbers displayed on, on vans would, would, would be a laudable thing. But the problem with <coughs> that is, is it's kind of after the fact. So when people are actually arranging for their waste to be collected, that is the point at which they need to see a, a registration number. Um, so they know that when they're actually booking their, for their waste to be collected, that they're using um, a, a, a registered carrier. So I, I, I can reassure members that alongside the bill, there's other important steps that are in train to tackle illegal operators. For example, SEPA has continued the process of... I'll finish my point, Mr Golden. It's continuing the process of consulting on the reform of waste carrier system and took an initial consultation on what types of conditions should go and requirements to hold a waste carrier's registration. Now, this included seeking views on introducing a requirement that a waste carrier registration number appears on any advert they, they place or in print or online. And this proposal will receive positive initial feedback and will take them forward in the next round of consultation. The display of the registration number at the point at which the householder is seeking to book the collection of waste is the key to this. And that, I, that, seems to be, uh, um, that, 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 that consultation seems to be the right point in the, sort of, the journey of the householder booking to have their waste collected that a registration number is as visible. And I'll take Mr Golden. Maurice Golden. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank the Minister for taking the intervention. I wonder if the Minister would consider the Scottish Government used to fund Waste Smart training via Zero Waste Scotland, and that really helped people who were involved in the waste process understand their duty of care with regards to uh, handling of waste, signing off transfer notes, etc. And I wonder if that's one positive step that the Scottish Government would consider going forward. Minister. I'm, I'm open to any suggestions on how we can get, I suppose, a sort of an understanding of the obligations that waste carriers have. And indeed, I think it's a comms piece for householders in knowing how to prevent a situation where they are actually booking an illegal waste contractor. People are wanting things uplifted and disposed of in a manner that they can trust. And we've heard today, and we've heard in stage one and stage two, how many illegal operators there are out there. So um, I'm open to any suggestions on how we can uh, make that comms piece better. Um, we recognise the awareness of existing duty of care obligations amongst ho householders and how they can check that licence uh, is low. I mean, that, that's the fact of the matter. The Scottish Government were committed to work with SEPA and other partners to ensure that that awareness improves, because I think that is the route to tackling this issue. Um, I'm mindful of the points raised by members in, in relation to the duty of care. I welcome the opportunity to explore this through a constructive a, a debate. I don't think mandating that uh, uh, the, the registration number be on the side of vans is the way to do it. Uh, Amendment 56 and 57 both relate to standardising waste receptacles across all local authorities. Um, I enjoyed hearing uh, Mr Mountain um, wrestle with his chart. 
Um, and I acknowledge that this debate has uh, continued throughout the passage of the bill, including Committee Stage 1 recommendation that a uniform curbside bin collection approach is established across Scotland and discussed the matter at length in Stage 2. But my, permission, uh, my position remains the same. I can't support the amendments. I can see the appeal, of course I can, on the potential benefits of standardising approaches across Scotland, which may aid public understanding of what people can recycle and to prevent the wrong items from put in the wrong bin accidentally. And the policy memorandum for this bill stated very clearly that our overarching aim is to make the right choices easier for households by supporting more consistent approaches to household recycling. However, we have also got a firm commitment to the co-design standards that form a new code of practice in partnership with local government, working with citizens and other uh, stakeholders, but most importantly, working with local authorities. It is vital that we take the necessary time to engage effectively on these key issues in order to understand different perspectives in a second and develop a new code that works for the whole country, but a code that is developed with those that have got responsibilities for uplifting the household waste that we generate. And as much as I may agree on the intentions, and I would love to see a situation where we have standardisation, these amendments unfortunately prejudge the outcome of that vital co-design process, which would not be in keeping with the Verity House Agreement. And I'll take Mr Lumsden. Yeah, Lumsden. I thank the Minister for taking another intervention. Um, it, it's just that you know, we're so far behind in reaching our recycling targets. And everything it seems, we seem to have suggested during the course of this afternoon that to try and get that recycling rate up higher has been rejected by the government. Can you not see the frustration from, from ourselves and, and others? First of all, I wouldn't agree. I wouldn't agree at all that every uh, reasonable uh, uh, amendment has been rejected by the government. I have worked very, very hard with members across the entire Parliament to make sure that I am supportive of amendments that get us where we need to be. What I don't want to do is prejudge any co-design process. I don't want to renege on any arrangements and agreements that we have with COSLA and our local authority partners who want to lead on this. I am certain that they will make the right decisions, they will share good practice and they will co-design a system that works for Scotland. And I want to reassure members that I do expect discussions about the potential for further standardisation to be front and centre of the discussions on the new code. Section 12 of the bill already provides that the new code make provision about the receptacles to be used by house for household waste collection. Therefore, if uniform bin colour design were agreed as part of this co-design of this requirement, it would be able to be incorporated in that statutory code of practice and it would achieve a similar result to this amendment, but it would be decided by the partners involved in this co-design. Furthermore, notwithstanding Mr Mountain's trip to the printer, these amendments are uncosted. Without a more detailed understanding of the potential costs or feasibility of these amendments, it would not be financially or environmentally responsible to support it. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. And I call Edward Mountain to wind up press withdrawal amendment 11. Mr. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Just, uh, I partly agree with what the Minister said on Amendment 11. It would be good to have the number on the advert, whether it be online or in the paper, to make sure that happens. But what, what we do know and what we often see going around uh, Scotland are vans loaded to the gunnels with a whole heap of waste. Now, we don't know if they are going to the right place or the wrong place. But we do know that if they didn't have the licence on the side of it, there's a fair chance they'd be going to the wrong place. And it would allow an enforcement level which wouldn't be capable uh, where we're at at the moment. I mean, it wasn't that long ago, uh, presiding officer, that we went through a system in our scrap dealers that people had to change the way they were paid, had to give their names and addresses for any scrap that, that was deleted. It didn't cause a huge amount of problem. And, and I, I'm sorry... Minister, I think you're missing an opportunity here to cut down fly tipping and, and decrease the cost to the people around Scotland who are now going to have to bear the cost of, of clearing up. Now, I know, uh, Minister, you, you wonder about whether my uh, research into bins across Scotland has, uh, has gone too deeply, but I agree with what uh, Mr McPherson has said, is that if we increase the value of the recyclate, that we'll actually end up getting uh, more operators out there. Don't forget, at the moment, we're only doing 43% of our household waste is effectively recycled. If we could find a way in 10 years, not a huge amount uh, tomorrow, 
but we could work towards it instead of allowing the system to further fragment as, as we've done in Aberdeen with the fiery red bin reduced, uh, introduced just uh, a couple of uh, um, months ago. We could try and come up with a system that's going to help with our uh, recycling and uh, make it more efficient. And, and I would say if it's not possible to support my amendment, um, you of course could support Mr Golden's amendment, uh, which I wouldn't dare say is, is secondary, but mine comes first. Uh, so on that note, I'll move Amendment 11, Presiding Officer. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament's not agreed. There will be a division of members who cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. <laughs> the result of the vote on Amendment Number 11 in the name of Edward Mountain is yes 52, no 60. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendments 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 and 20 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 1. Uh, I ask Graham Simpson to, if he wishes to move amendments uh, 12 to 20 on block. Mr Simpson? Um, I don't wish to move them on block. I'm not moving them on You're block. seeking to withdraw. Graham Simpson has indicated as you will have guessed from the ripple of applause, that he will not be moving amendments 12 to 20. It would be helpful if any member who wishes to move any of the amendments from 12 to 20 could indicate now. No member has indicated the wish to do so. I will therefore intend to uh, read out the amendment numbers and confirm that they are not moved. I will do so at a pace that would allow any member to call out at the relevant point if, uh, if they wish to move that amendment. So I confirm for the record that the following amendments in the name of Graham Simpson are not moved. Amendments 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 and 20. Thank you. I call Amendment 56 in the name of Edward Mountain. I already debated with Amendment 11. Edward Mountain to move or not move? Moved, Presiding Officer. Question is that Amendment 56 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament's not agreed. There'll be a division of members who cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed.
Point of order, Jamie Hepburn. I cannot tell whether or not my vote, or indeed the vote I would be casting as a proxy for Richard Walker, has been recorded. I can uh, reassure you, Mr Hepburn, both of those votes have been recorded. Okay, the result of the vote on amendment number 56 in the name of Edward Mountain is yes 28, no 87. There were no abstentions, therefore the amendment is not uh, agreed. Call amendment 57 in the name of Maurice Golden, also already debated with amendment 11. Uh, Maurice Golden to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved, which takes us on to group 11, Code of Practice on Household Waste Recycling. Call amendment 58 in the name of uh, Morris Golden, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Uh, Morris Golden to move amendment 58 and speak to the other amendments in the group. Mr Golden. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I would like to move amendment 58, which in conjunction with amendment 59 uh, gives more prominence to reuse and repair. Uh, which is important as they are higher up the waste hierarchy. Amendment 60 simply ensures that local authorities have sufficient funds and resources to enable them to carry out waste management functions, which clearly is uh, very important if there are asks from the Scottish Government with regard to that. Uh, Amendment 61 states that the Code of Practice must be prepared and published by March 26. This is because, uh, as members will be aware, that after that date uh, ministerial changes could be afoot and indeed government changes could be afoot. And therefore, any assurances that we have from this current government will cease to exist. That said, there is more than enough time for the Code of Practice to be prepared and published by that date. It is a, a relatively simple target to be achieved. It does not show ambition and therefore, even with that uh, low regard in terms of timescales, I believe the Scottish Government might just possibly be able to achieve it. Furthermore, 89 suggests that the code should be reviewed uh, every three years, which I think is valid. As we have heard uh, earlier in this debate, there is um, considerations around uh, changes which may be afoot. Uh, and 90 um, is complementary to that in terms of reviewing the code. Thank you. Thank you. And I call uh, Monica Lennon to speak to Amendment uh, 102 and other amendments in the group. Ms Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Amendments 102 and 103 in my name um, are about helping to achieve Scottish Labour's aims of strengthening the bill in relation to reuse, a point that has been made a number of times today already. We recognise the important role that both individual households and local authorities will play in the success of the bill. And much of this will be achieved through the Code of Practice, co-designed with local authorities. Through my interest in reusable nappies, which I know Douglas Thompson loves to hear about, and specifically North Ayrshire's scheme, it is quite apparent that there is a lack of awareness of such um, good schemes where they exist. So by requiring the Code of Practice to promote schemes such as North Ayrshire Councils, we can tap into the public desire to help the environment. I believe that the public want to do the right things, and by requiring reusable schemes to be promoted by the code where they exist, it will make it easier for people in Scotland to find out about such schemes in their local areas. So just to be clear, um, the amendment seeks to um, ensure that the code um, promotes reusable schemes operated by local authorities. Um, Maurice Golden, um, just to pick up on his amendments 58 and 59, um, we recognise that these will also help to boost the prioritisation of reuse and repair. So we're glad to see these brought forward. And we're also pleased to see amendment 60 um, by Maurice Golden requiring proper resourcing for local authorities to achieve their duties under the bill. Local authorities need to have adequate capacity 
uh, both in terms of skills and resources to make sure that we can become a more circular nation. And it is really important that the Scottish Government supports local authorities in every way it can to properly achieve a more circular economy. Thank you. I now call Bob Torres to speak to Amendment 87 and other amendments in the group. Mr Torres. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, section 12 of the Bill on the Code of Practice on Household Waste Recycling is aimed at producing greater consistency and coordination across local authorities in this area. The Bill states that the Code of Practice may address receptacles used for collection, frequency of collection, items for recycling and composting, <coughs> management of contamination of household waste and communication with the public on collections and recycling. However, the Bill is largely silent in this section on garden waste and bulky uplift. I believe there will be a relationship between any future Code of Practice and local authority strategies on bulky uplift and garden waste. My amendments 87 and 88 would not compel any Code of Practice on Household Waste to contain provisions for, for bulky uplift or garden waste. Rather, the amendments would allow those items to be considered, to be considered for inclusion in any future Code of Practice. I mentioned at stage two I was increasingly concerned about small scale, often everyday fly tipping in urban areas, particularly in areas of Glasgow that I represent, Maryhill and Springburn. Uh, I know many colleagues have got similar issues. Much of it can be unintended fly tipping, where people put out mattresses, couches, fridges, and other items in a place where only a few years ago was the recognised collection point for bulk uplifts before charges were introduced and systems have changed. There is clearly a relationship between charging regimes for bulk uplift across local authorities and fly tipping. Now, there is no statutory duty for local authorities to offer bulk uplifts or garden waste provision in this, and they would not seek to change that in any way. But all but one council, Fife, charges for bulk uplifts. Two councils have an annual fee and the rest have a variety of charging regimes. I could uh, regale you with those charging regimes, but that would be, that'd be very mountain-esque of me to take out my, my, my flowchart to, to explain, as Mr Mountain did earlier on in the previous debates. I will not, I will not do that. Uh, some charge per item and others charge for bundles of items. So there is a patchwork of provision which I set out in detail at stage two, if anyone really is that interested. But that patchwork includes seven councils who have reductions uh, or exemptions for low-income households or for households that are local authority tenants. If someone is in a flat, the presiding officer has no garden, has no car, is on a low income, and there are charges in place when they have to get rid of a carpet or a sofa or a mattress or a fridge or whatever, their options are far more limited than many others. It is not unreasonable to suggest that a future code of practice in household waste may wish to at least consider, at least consider <coughs> such circumstances. There are similar scenarios for garden waste removal, and I would note that six local authorities offer no garden waste services whatsoever, seven offer a service for free, and a variety of charging regimes across the rest. Again, a patchwork of provision across the country. Now, it may be, presiding officer, that when a code of practice household waste is developed in partnership with local authorities, that it is decided not to include or have regard for bulky or garden waste. However, these amendments would provide a clear opportunity and pathway for them to do so, and I was pleased to discuss this in a bit more detail with the Minister ahead of Stage 3 also, and I thank her for our constructive discussions in relation to this. So on the basis of what I put before Parliament this evening, I would ask uh, members to consider uh, my two amendments here within this section. Thank you. And I call Graeme Simpson to speak to Amendment 21 and other amendments in the group. Mr Simpson. Thanks very much. Um, mandating consistent household collections through an updated National Code of Practice is a critical step in creating a consistent approach to recycling collections across Scotland. Any approach should include as wide a range of materials as possible, including drink cartons, to drive progress towards a truly circular economy. It is vital that drink cartons remain in the metal plastic beverage carton collection stream as set out in the existing code of practice to ensure that they can be easily sorted for recycling. Now, presiding officer, when people send things to be recycled, when they put them in their recycling bins, it's essential that they're able to trust that those materials will actually be recycled. And that's sometimes not the case, particularly with cartons. And it came as a surprise to me when I heard that. And I'm sure all members dutifully put drink cartons in the right bin, but they'll be as surprised as I was to discover that quite often they don't actually get recycled. And without the mandating of sorting, 
consumers cannot be confident that this will be the case. That's because it's only through proper sorting that materials can be sent to the most appropriate destination for processing. So without mandatory sorting, there's a risk that for commercial reasons, a waste management company will choose to treat less valuable materials as contaminant, put it in a different material stream, rather than sorting it so it can be sent to the most appropriate processing facilities. So Amendment 21 fixes that problem. While 37 is less prescriptive in that it doesn't mention cartons, we need to create the conditions where there's a market to recycle materials. I've discussed this with the Minister. Too much is slipping through the net. And I said to the Minister that this bill ultimately needs to actually achieve something, one of which is recycling and the other is reuse. And these amendments achieve the recycling bit. So they're actually really important. I think the Minister understands the importance of it, so I'm looking forward to hearing her views on that. Thank you. Thank you. And I call the Minister. Thank you, President Officer. <clears throat> In relation to Amendments 58 and 59 from Morris Golden and 102 and 103 from Monica Lennon, I very much appreciate the intention behind the amendments, but I have said many times that reuse and repair are important tools in achieving a circular economy. The new Code of Practice will refresh standards in relation to local authorities' statutory waste management obligations related to the collection and recycling of household waste, and this includes preparation for reuse. In other words, activities where products and parts of those products that have become waste are made suitable for reuse. And they also have obligations to manage waste with regard to the waste hierarchy. However, as I also said at stage two, the new code could not prescribe mandatory requirements for reuse and repair services because these don't fall within local authority statutory waste management functions. And for this reason, I can't support these amendments. Um, the committee... Um, the, 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 the Chamber should note that in the current voluntary code of practice there is guidance on desirable reuse activities, approaches, uh, communication that local authorities should consider. I am keen to build on that approach through the planned co-design of the new code of practice to explore more opportunities to enhance local authority activities, to promote reuse and repair on a voluntary or recommended basis, even if these do not become uh, statutory duties. Turning to Amendments 87 and 88 from Bob Doris, these amendments raise the important issue of bulky waste and garden waste that we discussed at Stage 2, and I agree it is important to ensure that waste and recycling services included for collection of bulky and garden waste are easy to use and accessible to all. In the draft Circular Economy and Waste Route Map, we have set out the intention to review household waste collection services for which a charge may be made by 2025, including uplift of bulky items and garden waste. And the intention is that this feeds in to the co-design of the new code of practice. Having reflected and discussed further with the members in stage two, and I'm content that identify this specifically in the bill will ensure, ensure our existing commitment receives the attention it deserves whilst not constraining co-design, and I am therefore very comfortable accepting Mr Doris' amendments. I will now turn to amendments 21 and 37 from Graham Simpson. And, and I agree that it is important to ensure that local authority waste management services are comprehensive and result in high quality recycling. However, uh, Mr Simpson will probably be disappointed to hear that there are several reasons why I can't support his amendments, but I want to explain them. Firstly, the wording of the amendment is problematic as local authorities are required to collect waste and not materials. Secondly, local authority obligations in respect of waste collection are set out in the Environmental Protection Act of 1990, and substantive changes to this could not be achieved solely by stipulating so in the Code of Practice. And importantly, this existing provision imposes obligations in relation to the separate waste collection of dry, recyclable waste, which is defined to include a list of materials, glass, metals, plastic, paper and card. There are related <laughs> duty of care obligations with respect to this waste and its management after collection, including the sorting of it into separate streams 
which apply beyond local authorities. An amendment to include these or any specific items or materials in the Code of Practice is unnecessary, but also potentially complicates existing service delivery. Existing provision in the EPA underpins local authority and commercial waste collection, the transport of waste, the sorting and reprocessing of waste, and many of the associated obligations. The new definitions may interfere with this and may also have implications for producer responsibility obligations in relation to packaging and the introduction of uh, packaging EPR. Adding a requirement to sort waste into, quote, dedicated waste streams is unfortunately ambiguous. It's unclear at which stage in the process the separation is expected, whether it's by householders, local authorities, private waste businesses, or a combination of these parties, and it may not be compatible with collection methods. And lastly, the amendment is on a must basis, which acts to constrain the approach to co-design in any future revisions. So whilst I share the member's goal on the promoting high quality recycling and having more materials um, recycled. I can't support these amendments as they're written. I want to turn to amendments uh, from Maurice Golden in relation to amend Amendment 60. I recognise and understand the limitations on the resources that local authorities face, and the Scottish Government is committed to working closely with local authorities and providing the support that's needed to create a practical and sustainable service. The new code, crucially, will be agreed by local government. It will be developed with local government who are best placed to indicate if they're sufficiently funded for the measures jointly agreed, and that's a pro an approach that's agreed with COSLA. Uh, that can be fed into the ordinary annual budget process, and on that basis I can't support this amendment. With regard to Amendment 61, whilst I understand and I share the desire to ensure that a new code of practice is available as soon as possible, the Government can't support the amendment. We cannot set a statutory deadline on the face of the Bill that could potentially be unworkable and prevent meaningful co-design and consultation on the new code. And as it says in the Waste and Circular Economy route map, and I stated during uh, Stage 2 at the committee session, it's an indicative date for the publication of the Code of Practice. It is important to ensure that sufficient time is given, should it be necessary, to guarantee that all relevant voices are heard in this process, rather than setting an arbitrary deadline. It will be ready when it has been consulted upon and agreed on. Finally, Amendments 89 and 90 would require that the new Code of Practice is reviewed every three years. The Bill already makes provision for the Code to be reviewed at appropriate junctures, setting a fixed ye three-yearly cycle on the face of the Bill is inadvisable and impractical for a number of reasons. It takes time for local authorities to implement service changes and put infrastructure in place, and many existing recycling improvement fund projects helping local authorities to align with the existing Code run over multiple years. So the impact of a new code would need to be robustly evaluated after it's been implemented based on the data that also takes time to collect, verify and analyse. And that's why I can't support those amendments. Douglas Thompson. Mr. for taking an intervention. It's, it's just on the um, Amendment 61 in Morris Golden's name in terms of the, the March 26 deadline for producing the, uh, the code. If, if that amendment can't be agreed, can the Minister give any indication when she would expect the code to be published? Minister. As I said, March 26, 2026 is an indicative date for the publication of the Code of Practice. Thank you. I now call on Morris Golden to wind up Press of Withdrawal Amendment 58. Mr Golden. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. The amendments in this group are, are positive ones. They are not transformational um, compared to some of the other amendments which have failed thus far. But I think they would help to achieve a circular economy. I think um, overall in this group, unfortunately, we are not going to get the constructive approach that perhaps we achieved on the climate change under Rosanna Cunningham's stewardship in the last session, but we are where we are today. I think the Minister has made clear on the March 2026 20, date as an indicative date for the Code of Practice. But of course, if that isn't achieved and if it isn't in the bill, then who and which members of this parliament will be able to question the minister after that date? And who will be responsible for that? No one. 
The Thank question you. is that Amendment 58 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. There'll be a division and members should cast a vote now. And the vote is now closed. And the result of the vote on Amendment 58 in the name of Morris Golden is yes 54, no 61. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Call Amendment 102 in the name of Monica Lennon. Already debated with Amendment 58. Monica Lennon to move or not move? Moved. Question is that Amendment 102 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. There'll be a division of members should cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. Point of order, Bill Kidd. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. My uh, phone seems to be tired. Um, however, what am I voting? No, it's no. I'm voting no. Thank you. <laughs> it was so long ago I couldn't remember, but it's no. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kidd. I will ensure that vote is recorded. And the result of the vote on amendment number 102 in the name of Monica Lennon is yes 57, no 59. There were no abstentions. Uh, the amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 59 in the name of Morris Golden. I already debated with amendment 58. Morris Golden, move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. I call amendment 103 in the name of Monica Lennon. Already debated with amendment 58. Monica Lennon, to move or not move? Moved. The question is that um, uh, amendment 103 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament's not agreed. There'll be a division of members who cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed.
And the result of the vote on amendment number 103 in the name of Monica Lennon is yes 54, no 62. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 87 in the name of Bob Doris. Already debated with amendment 58. Bob Doris, to move or not move? A moved. The question is that amendment 87 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is agreed. I call amendment 88 in the name of Bob Doris. Already debated with amendment 58. Bob Doris, to move or not move? Moved. The question is that amendment 88 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is agreed. I call Amendment 21 in the name of Graham Simpson. Already debated with Amendment 58. Uh, Graham Simpson to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. I call Amendment 37 in the name of Graham Simpson. Already debated with Amendment 58. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. I call Amendment 60 in the name of Morris Golden. Already debated with Amendment 58. Morris Golden to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 60 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament's not agreed. There'll be a division of members who cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 60 in the name of Morris Golden is yes 51, no 65. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 61 in the name of Morris Golden. Already debated with amendment 58. Morris Golden to move or not move? Moved. question is that amendment 61 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament's not agreed. There will be a division of members who cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. And the result of the vote on amendment number 61 in the name of Morris Golden is yes 46, no 69. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 89 in the name of Morris Golden. Already debated with amendment 58. Morris Golden to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. I call amendment 90 in the name of Morris Golden. Already debated with amendment 58. Morris Golden to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. I call amendment 22 in the name of Graeme Simpson. Already debated with amendment 1. Graeme Simpson to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. I call amendment 62 in the name of Morris Golden. Already debated with amendment 50. Morris Golden to move or not move? Moved. The question is that amendment 62 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament's not agreed. There'll be a division of members who cast their votes now.
And the vote is now closed. Point of order, Kevin Stewart. Um, the digital platform seems to have failed. I would have voted no. I can assure you, Mr uh, Stewart, your, vo your vote was recorded. So the result of the vote on Amendment No. 62 in the name of Maurice Golden is yes, 55, no, 62. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Uh, I call Amendment uh, 104 in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 50. Monica Lennon, to move or not move? Moved. question is, Amendment 104 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. There will be a division of members who cast the vote now. And the vote is now closed. The result of the vote on Amendment No. 104 in the name of Monica Lennon is yes, 55, no, 62. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 91 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 50. Minister, move formally. Moved. Question is, Amendment 91 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. Vote is now closed. The result of the vote on Amendment No. 91 in the name of uh, Gillian Martin is yes, 97, no, 19. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call Amendment 23 in the name of Graeme Simpson. Already debated with Amendment 1. Graeme Simpson to move or not move? That is not moved. I call Amendment 24 in the name of Graeme Simpson, already debated with Amendment 1. Graeme Simpson to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. Uh, we therefore move to Group 12, littering from vehicles, civil penalties. I call Amendment number 63 in the name of Edward Mountain in a group of its own. Edward Mountain to uh, move and speak to Amendment 63. Mr Mountain. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I think every member of this Parliament has somewhere in their constituency which <clears throat> has become a rubbish bin <laughs> Sorry, <clears throat> because people have chucked their rubbish out of the window. I'm minded every time I drive north on the A9 in the First Minister's constituency just north of Dalna Cardock on the A9 on the dual carriageway there where rubbish is strewn down the verge because it's dumped by people because they know they can't be seen. 
Now, the problem is with these areas where rubbish is dumped, it's usually in inaccessible places, making it very difficult to catch people and also making it dangerous to recover that rubbish, often leading to the closure of the road. And we have seen the A9 closed on occasions, as I believe the M8 or lanes of the M8 have been closed to allow the rubbish to be recovered. So these are the people that drive along in their cars and are able to take their rubbish home but can't be bothered and throw it out of the window. To me, that's totally unacceptable. It litters some of the most beautiful places in Scotland. So my proposal is to increase the fine uh, for these, uh, what we locally would, or colloquially would call tossers, uh, to £250. It seems to be logical. Now, that fine could be reduced uh, if paid within seven days to £125, which would take it down to the same level that you are charged if you park in a car park that is privately owned for three minutes more than your time. There are many car parks that charge £100 for that offence. In fact, if it, if it was the second time you'd offended in an LEZ, you would be charged £120. It's the same level of money. So it's a question of what we believe is right to discourage people. My belief is that £250 would certainly discourage people. It is difficult to catch them, therefore we need that money to be available to local councils to ensure that it's enforced. If we don't give them the resources to do that, they, they won't do anything. So that's my argument, uh, presiding officer. Simple and effective way of stopping uh, the dumb dumpers out of the car windows. Thank you. I now call on the Minister. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I understand the intentions behind Amendment 63, and we've spoken to Edward Mountain about this um, uh, in preparation for today, but I can't support it. To begin with, I think it's important to emphasise that Section 14 of the Bill does not deal with criminal prosecution for littering with, from vehicles. It's about providing an alternative to prosecution, a civil penalty charge against the keeper of a vehicle in relation to the offence of littering committed from a vehicle. Section 87 of the Envir Environmental Protection Act 1990 already provides for the offence of littering and sets the potential fine for the offence at a maximum of £2,500 if someone is convicted by a court. So for more serious offences of littering, there could be prosecution which, if it led to a conviction, could lead to a much higher fine as well as a criminal record. And the Environmental Protection Act um, also provides for an existing alternative to pro prosecution, which is a fixed penalty notice, which enforcement authorities can use instead of reporting a person for prosecution. It is currently set at £80, and ministers have the powers to adjust that by way of secondary legislation for up to £500. So because of those other existing methods of enforcement for littering offences, Section 14 of the Bill is therefore designed in particular for instances of littering for vehicles. And feedback from local authorities suggests it's often difficult to ascertain the identity of a person who leaves litter when that littering offence occurs from a vehicle. And this creates a gap in current enforcement pr provisions and weakens the deterrent power of the existing fixed penalty notice. So this additional civil enforcement power is intended to provide further powers for local authorities to tackle littering from vehicles. It provides flexibility to allow ministers to set the amount that may be imposed by way of a civil penalty charge and to increase that amount in the future through regulations following an appropriate level of consultation with relevant stakeholders, including local authorities. And the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee was content with the use of regulations for this in Stage 1, their Stage 1 report, and the use of affirmative procedure to ensure the level of civil penalty can be scrutinised by Parliament. So in our view, the setting of a level of a civil penalty charge at £250 on the face of the bill would be disproportionate with respect to the nature of the offence and the existing legislation for enforcement of littering offences. However, I am, I am in considering Amendment 63, and I have said this to Mr Mountain in our, our conversations around this, I'm mindful that the current level of fixed penalty for littering has been set at £80 for 10 years. And I'm happy to reassure Mr Mountain that we will look to review this 
as we develop the civil penalty for littering from a vehicle to ensure they're both set at a proportionate level. But for the reasons I set out, I can't support his Amendment 63 today. Thank you. I call on Edward Mountain to wind up. Presser, withdraw Amendment 63, Mr uh, Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And given the lateness of the hour, I don't mean to reiterate my argument, or I have no intention of doing that. Well, I would say that this offence is attached to the owner of the vehicle, which I think is the right place uh, for it to be, and a fine of £250 for putting road workers' lives at risk, to me, seems paltry. Uh, and therefore, I will move the amendment, presiding officer. Thank you. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 63 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division of members who cast their vote now. And the vote is now closed. And the result of the vote on Amendment 63 in the name of Edward Mountain is yes, 48, no, 68. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not. 68, no. 68 sorry. And there were no abstentions. I'll repeat that. Yes, 48, uh, no, 68. There were no abstentions. The uh, amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendments 25, 26, 27, 28, 29 and 30 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 1. And I ask Graham Simpson if he wishes uh, to move amendments 25 to 30 on block. Mr Simpson. I'm not moving them. Thank you. Graham Simpson has indicated he will not be a moving, uh, moving amendments 25 to 30. It would be helpful if any member uh, who wishes to move any of the amendments from 25 to 30 could indicate now. No member has indicated they wish to do so. I therefore intend to read out the amendment numbers and confirm that they are not moved. I will do so at a pace that would allow any member to call out at the relevant point that they wish to move the amendment. So I confirm for the record that the following amendments in the name of Graham Simpson are not moved. 25, 26, 27, 28, 29 and 30. That takes us on to group 13, reusable nappies. I call amendment 105 in the name of Monica Lennon in a group on its own, and I call Monica Lennon to speak to, to move and speak to amendment 105. Ms Lennon. Thank you, presiding officer. My amendment 105 is indeed in a group of its own, and I can see Douglas Lumsden is very excited. So, at uh, almost half past seven at night, I'm glad to be uh, uh, waking up the, the, the Tory front bench um, at least. So, this group is about reusable nappies. We've been building up to this, uh, not just through um, the debate today, but also throughout stages one and, and two, but actually through parliamentary questions and discussions I've had. Um, with various members of the government, but most importantly with people outside across the country who can see the benefit of this amendment. So why am I proposing this? Well, Scotland sends 160 million single-use nappies to landfill every year. We know that on average each baby or, or toddler will use around 5,000 disposable nappies. It is an expensive business for families, but also for local authorities in terms of landfill costs and ultimately for our environment. So, where better to tackle this 
than through the circular economy bill. And the inspiration for this proposal has come from one of our local authorities, North Ayrshire Council, where its reusable nappy scheme has been operating successfully since 2019, introduced by Scottish Labour, but continued by, continued by an SNP administrat administration. Sorry, it is getting late. Um, Lorna Slater, the former Circular Economy Minister, and I went on a visit to North Ayrshire, I think it was back in March, um, where we met with the officers who have been involved in, in operating that scheme and promoting it to, to local people in North Ayrshire. And we also met one of the parents who has benefited from that scheme. Um, and I think it was good, as a member of the Net Zero Environment and Transport Committee, uh, sorry, Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee and with the then Minister to get out of Parliament and go on that visit um, and try and find out what has been going on there and what makes this good practice tick. And I also thank Lorna Slater for um, being the first Minister to agree to meet with me to talk about this. And that led to um, the Minister commissioning the James Hutton Institute to undertake some research to investigate the barriers to the use of reusable nappies, because if they can save families money and they can help our environment, then why is it not um, more mainstream? So perhaps return to, to that visit in a moment. But in terms of the, the amendment in front of everyone today, it's supported by Scottish Environment Link, by Action to Protect Rural Scotland, FIDRA, Friends of the Earth Scotland, Keep Scotland Beautiful and Marine Conservation Society, all organisations that are widely respected by colleagues in the Chamber. Um, I think the proposal would not only help in terms of local impact but also on global impact and colleagues including Sarah Boyack today have talked about our obligations in terms of environmental justice and we know that there has been a problem with the offshoring of, of nappy waste um, and issues around the supply chain as well so I won't repeat some of the points made earlier on about um, human rights and environmental justice but I think um, the facts speak for themselves. Um, I know this is a circular economy bill, but one of the things that we have discussed is where we can um, avoid siloed working and try and do things in a joined up way. So when North Ayrshire brought in the scheme in 2019, it was, it was very much about trying to be more circular, but it was also an anti-poverty measure. Um, and I think today we can see how this kind of scheme um, available in other council areas would help families who are struggling with the cost of living. Um, we also know that in terms of reducing waste stream contamination, um, when there is baby waste on nappies, that does cause um, many issues. Um, and again, there are practical um, benefits of this. I brought this to the committee at stage two. Um, but I did withdraw the amendment at that time to take up the offer from the, the current minister, um, Gillian Martin, discuss further opportunities and possibilities. Because, you know, Mark Ruskell talked a little bit about sort of frustrations that we all have. One of the frustrations that I have had for a couple of years now is that we've only got a handful of councils doing something around this issue of um, promoting access to reusable nappies. And certainly from my point of view, it's not about telling people you must use these products, but it's about creating um, more choice and giving people more options. Um, so I think we need to better understand why other councils have not been able to learn from the good practice in, in North Ayrshire, particularly because we know that that scheme operates on a cost-neutral basis. I want to just mention something that the Scottish Government is doing that I think is really positive, and that is around the, the baby box. Um, where people can opt in to uh, use the, the, the voucher on reusable nappies. But the issue in recent years is that uptake has remained static at around 13 14%. And I know that um, Shirley Ann Somerville, a social justice secretary, is also looking at that. But again, the James Hutton Institute perhaps um, will give us a bit more insight into some of the barriers. Now, I'll be keen to hear from the Minister um, the, the lessons that we can take just now from the James Hutton um, report and whether that might lead to some action like a short life um, working group. Um, in terms of the amendment, I think 
you know, again, in my mind, this is, is, is quite straightforward. Um, when I met with North Ayrshire Council, they are very proud, rightly, of what they're achieving. They are helping families in a practical way, and they're diverting waste away from landfill. They're doing their bit for the environment, and they're helping families with the cost of living. But I think what it shows is that our councils are so busy trying to do their core work. They don't really have time to shout about the great work they're doing. They don't then promote it um, to others. And we've got an example in Ayrshire, which is not my parliamentary region, so I've not really got any skin in the game here, but we've got Ayrshire Nappy Library, led by volunteers, working in a pan-Ayrshire way. But only one part of Ayrshire, North Ayrshire, has this scheme, and the other families who come along from East and South Ayrshire currently don't. Um, this is not about prescribing to local councils how they would operate the scheme, but it's certainly about trying to make something happen. So I'm going to um, stop there. I hope other members will take part, particularly Douglas Lumsden, who's shown a bit of an interest earlier on, if he is still with us. Um, but genuinely hope to hear more from the Minister, who has been very constructive in her approach. But I know that there's still something holding the government and maybe others back from, from getting stuck into this issue. So again, I'll end where I started. If it's not the Circular Economy Bill, then where? And I call Mark Ruskell. Thank you very much, um, Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank Monica Lennon for continuing to press and, and really campaign uh, on this issue. It is clear that we need you know, really good reuse schemes operating across lots of different types of items uh, in our economy. You know, nappies is a, is a really good example. Um, I'd add in bikes as well. You know, there are some great um, initiatives with bike libraries that are being set up with local authorities working with social enterprises in, in a similar way. So, you know, there's loads of opportunities here for councils to be working with the third sector to drive this forward. But I do think the most appropriate way to develop these reusable schemes is through the waste route map. It's not about putting you know, individual schemes on the face of, of this bill. Um, now, my earlier amendment, um, 44, um, that we discussed earlier, uh, requires ministers to consider reuse, refill and take back schemes as part of the strategy. And, and I absolutely will personally, and I know Monica Lennon will as well, be holding the minister to account to ensure that nappies uh, are considered um, as part of that, because I do think there's a strong case. But I think we also have to acknowledge that you know, we've had reusable nappy schemes on the go now um, for over 20 years. Um, I was proud to use them on, on my children in, in Stirling, the social enterprise, um, 18 years ago this year. I know Monica's um, used them as well with, with her children. But uh, there is a doubt in my mind. I think we also need to understand why then, given that we did have successful schemes almost 20 years ago, why the public uptake has really not followed on the back of that. Um, so I think it is actually a win that you know, Monica Lennon has secured working with the Minister at the time, Lorna Slater, uh, a government report to be done, produced by James Hutton Institute, that looks at the public attitude towards a reusable nappies and can hopefully point to a way ahead about how we can make these reusable schemes more accessible, cheaper um, and more successful going forward. But I don't think right now um, that we can draw in all of that learning uh, and put that on the face of the bill to actually require it. I can see Ms Lennon wants to come Monica in. Lennon. <clears throat> um, I'm grateful to Mark Ruskell for his comments and his interest in this as a fellow uh, cloth bum parent, if that's the, the right terminology um, these days. Um, I suppose I, I just want to say, in terms of trying to get a bit of debate here, is that the scheme in North Ayrshire has been on the go since 2019. We know in the past there were other schemes. Every year when Reusable Nappy Week comes around, which I think is normally in April, when I go on social media, I see lots of activity being promoted by local authorities in England and Wales. But I feel quite sad not to see more of that in Scotland. I know that Lorna Slater has heard me say this before. So we're not seeing progress being made. The Amendment 105 um, does would require local authorities to bring a scheme in by April 2026. So it gives a bit of time. There's time, and I've, I've had a chat with Coisler, there's no objection to this, learning more from North Ayrshire. But if we don't start to provide a bit of national direction leadership on this, does Mark Ruskell not share my concern that we'll actually not see any more schemes emerge in Scotland? And that would be a real shame. Mark Ruskell? Well, it would be a real shame, but I do think all of that 
good practice is difficult to kind of sum up and lump into a, a bill. Uh, I, I do think the most appropriate way forward is, is actually the way forward that Ms Lennon has secured by working with the Minister, which is to get James Hutton Institute to do an extensive piece of work on this and to really look at how you embed that good practice. So I, I do think all of that kind of work, whether we're talking about nappies, whether we're talking about bikes, whether we're talking about a whole range of other reusable items, needs to be taken through detailed work um, in, in the route map. So I'm not convinced that a legislative approach at this point is is the way to crack it, but, but I think we will crack it, and, and, I, and I think you know, there's a strong future for these schemes, but I think it's best done in a, in a non-legislative route, and I know that Ms Lennon will hold the government's feet to the fire over this. Thank you, and I call the Minister. Thank you. Um, I, I think, as, as I said in stage two, I think this is a, a good debate to have, and I commend Monica Lennon for her campaigning on this issue. Because without campaigns and without talking about these things, nothing will ever change. There's a, there's a lot of uh, barriers, it seems to me, in, in, in parents taking up the, the opportunities that there are to uh, not be uh, using the, the, the disposable nappies that are out there. Yet, they still are the number one type of nappy that's used. Despite everything that Monica Lennon said about schemes that are available in certain local authority areas, despite the lower cost that there is, despite the fact that the baby box has got vouchers associated with it, there are still many barriers. And obviously, Miss um, Slater commissioned that research from the James Hutton Institute, who came back and just said that you know, there are still a lot of barriers there, but it was very difficult to ascertain what they were, and there's still a lot of data needed. I think the thing is that, that, that's required, I'll, I'll come to you in a second, Mr. Mr. Golden. I think what, what I'm very reluctant to do is to have a top-down dictatorial approach to this. It's, it's unfortunate that other local authorities haven't looked at the successes of North Ayrshire and thought that this is a great idea. And I'm hoping that the co-design process will allow that good practice to be shared. I would like to see a situation where so many more local authorities, having listened to the debates that's happened here, having listened to Ms Lennon campaigning on the issue, having listened to other local authorities as part of that co-design process, start to think this is something that we really want to get behind. I'll take Mr Golden. Morris Golden. Uh, I thank the Minister for taking an intervention. Almost 20 years ago, the Scottish Government stopped funding for the Real Nappy campaign to encourage uh, people to use real nappies. I wonder if the Minister can highlight the reasons behind that decision. Minister. I'm not going to jump into anyone else's portfolio, um, because, but I, I think that there's a, it's actually a, a, a good point. It's about the, the comms around this, the encouragement. We have had situations in the past, again, not wanting to jump into my colleagues' portfolios, where we've had campaigns against you know, breastfeeding over formula, and it's about the, co the communication that we have there. We're doing our best to, to encourage behavioural change uh, with regard to re uh, reusable nappies through the baby box, but I know that Ms Lennon has had conversations with Ms Somerville on this very fact. And it comes back to this point, is the Circular Economy Bill the best place to do this? Well, it's part of you know, it, the, the co-design process that there's going to, this bill is going to engender. It's part of the solution and moving forward, but there's also other conversations we have to have in other parts of government, but also with the local authorities um, that are going to be uh, working on the co-design process. So it is a good debate to have. I would like to see a lot more people using reusable nappies. Of course, we all would. Why are there barriers in place? James Hutton Institute has um, uh, provided a report which gives some detail onto what those might be. Um, I am against the detailed top-down approach, though, that restricts the ability for decision-making to be made at local level by local authorities. But I would encourage local authorities to look at the very successful schemes that Ms Lennon has identified and that Ms Slater went to visit as well with her um, a couple of months ago. I am happy to consider how we can support and encourage behaviour change in this area. We have already included a commitment within our draft route map to facilitate sharing of best practice and reuse, including reusable nappy schemes, to support take-up 
across Scotland. Um, and further, at stage two, the committee agreed an amendment which requires to have in regard to behavioural change in the development of the circular economy strategy. But I also want to mention a, very, a point that's really stayed with me about something that Monica Lennon said in stage two when she was uh, bringing this forward, is that quite a lot of the times the people making decisions around what they prioritise at local authority level uh, areas are doing it without the lens of a parent or a mother. And that's why I encourage Ms Lennon to think about sort of the gendered lens approach to this. You know, if we have enough people in this area talking about the importance of using reusable nappies, then we might get some change there. I don't want to dictate it through this bill. I want that to come from local authorities. So I can't support the amendment um, and, uh, with regret because the aims are laudable, but I can't support this amendment. Thank you, Minister. I call Monica Lennon to wind up and to press or withdraw Amendment 105. Ms Lennon. Um, I'm grateful to both Mark Ruskell and to the Minister for their contributions. I think it's important that, following on from Stage 2, we've had a chance to get this on the record today and explore the progress made since we last discussed it in terms of the publication of the James Hudson Institute report and what we can maybe learn from that. I think there's more work needs to be done um, and hopefully we can work on that uh, together. I was disappointed not to hear from Douglas Lumsden because I thought he wanted to contribute in this debate today. Uh, he's just overwhelmed by, by what he's heard. Um, but I hope that perhaps as... Um, constituents in regional MSPs, we can go back to our own local authorities and actually our health boards. I had earlier amendments to stage two on what our health boards can do because when I did FOI that, our health boards are spending quite a lot of money on single-use nappies, but that's a point where we can, in addition to the baby box, through conversations with health visitors and midwives and others to try and raise a bit of awareness and, and take some of the stigma out of this and the worry that there's extra laundry and extra work when actually people who do try reusables um, do really enjoy it and feel the benefit. I, I will say that I think it is a shame that in the last couple of years we've seen the demise of tot spots. Tot spots where the reusable nappy firm who supplied the baby box have gone out of business. And again, linking this work into just transition and community wealth building, we've got opportunities to do things differently. Um, I know um, Maurice Golden and others who are involved in the, the cross-party group in circular economy try and look at this in the widest possible way and it's of interest to every portfolio actually. So again, where we've had uh, companies and other enterprises um, who have a real passion about this um, and have an interest in product, it's a shame when we see those businesses you know, literal goods in the toilet, they should be thriving. So think about it in terms of just transition as well. And the other thing I would leave the Minister to think about, but again, it's not only in her portfolio, is that through the Period Products Act, we've seen what can happen when we create opportunities through legislation. So you could argue that the Period Products Act was top down, but what that's allowed to happen is people to access in their own communities or their own schools or colleges, access to reusable period products that they wouldn't have had before. And that's allowed people to try products, it's maximised choice, it's not dictatorial, but it is about giving people access where they are, um, including in their own local authorities. So I'll leave that there because that's something that local authorities have really embraced. They're doing excellent work on it and people around the world look to Scotland to learn from that. We could do something along those lines with reusable nappies. But I'm really pleased to have commitments from Ms Martin today. Um, I do hope to see the, the finalised route map includes this commitment and for that work to continue, for that to perhaps be in the strategy as well. But I wonder if perhaps there could be a short life working group to, to look at the James Hutton Institute findings um, and, and take that forward with a bit more oomph. Um, I thought, sorry, I thought Morris Golden was getting up, but I think he's just stretching. Yep, he's sitting back down. Um, so, given what we've heard today, um, I won't move the amendment, but I look forward to working with the Scottish Government in the future. Thank you, Ms Lennon. Uh, in fact, Monica Lennon seeks to withdraw Amendment 105. Does any member object? No, no member objects. Amendment 105 is withdrawn. I now turn to Group 14, Waste Reprocessing 
Infrastructure. I call Amendment 64 in the name of Maurice Golden, group with Amendment 64A. And I call on Maurice Golden to move Amendment 64 and to speak to both amendments in the group. Mr Golden. Thank you, Deputy President. Officer, um, this is a similar amendment to the one I brought at stage two, but did not press at that stage. And I have had a constructive conversation with the Minister regarding this amendment 64. Now, the context of this is the Scottish Government previously commissioned Dr Colin Church to do a similar review with regards to incineration. And I would like to see this mirrored across all waste infrastructure. The review on incineration was ultimately com commissioned too late and identified overcapacity. But I think there is an opportunity in other areas, for example, anaerobic digestion linked to feedstock mapping, a plastic recycling facility, particularly when you consider that only 2 per cent of plastics collected for recycling in Scotland are actually recycled here. Uh, also, perhaps opportunities around an electric arc furnace and turbine, wind turbine refurbishment. Government guidance would lead and influence the market, and I think this amendment would help to positively encourage both private investment and potentially uh, public investment in this area. And it is ultimately for the Scottish Government to help to intervene in the market in this manner, in my view. Because if we follow the let the market rip approach, we will have unintended consequences, as we have seen with incineration. Uh, happy to move Amendment 64. Thank you, Mr Golden. I now call on Mark Rusko to move and speak to Amendment 64A and uh, the other amendment in the group. Yep. Mr Rusko. Thanks, um, Presiding Officer. Um, so, I mean, in principle, I do support Maurice Golden's Amendment 64, and I think I recognise, as I'm sure he does, that the review of Scotland's incineration capacity, commissioned by my colleague here, Lorna Slater, has been enormously helpful, because prior to that, there really was no understanding from government about what the level of incineration uh, was actually needed in Scotland. And as a result, what we had effectively was a free-for-all within the planning system with lots of companies proposing speculative developments, each of them claiming that their capacity was needed to meet Scotland's need. Um, so we, we have that now, and I think that's a, an important precedent that was set by the, by the former minister, and I, and I know that's inspired this amendment from, from Maurice Golden. Um, and we do need this kind of level of analysis for all waste infrastructure in the round. You know, what infrastructure do we need in Scotland? Where are the best locations? What capacity do we have at the moment? Where is it located? Wh which regions, which sectors? Um, where can we be fostering innovation uh, to deliver meaningful change? Those are the kind of questions that need to be thoroughly investigated, and that's why you know, I support the, the bulk of Mr Golden's amendment. However, I, I do want to see some of the, the specifics and, and the kind of detail in his amendment being used as a basis for it being rejected. And that's why I've lodged Amendment 64A to his amendment, um, because I don't think it's necessary you know, to have detail uh, about, about a, a broader sort of waste strategy within the waste infrastructure um, plan. Um, I, I think that can be dealt with you know, elsewhere with, within the route map and, and, and in other, other areas of policy. Um, so uh, I urge members to support 64A so Parliament can unite behind a meaningful investigation of Scotland's waste infrastructure that really builds on the good work that's already been started by this government on incineration. Thank you, Mr Ruskell. I call on the Minister. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, I set out stage two that I support the proactive ambition set out in these amendments to increase the visibility of existing and planned waste reprocessing infrastructure. And I met with Mr Golden at stage, after stage two, agreed to commission a report of this type. Um, there is work already underway, actually, on uh, many of the detailed requirements proposed in his amendment, including waste data tracking, recycling improvements and acting on the findings of the recent incineration uh, review. I also want to mention he mentioned um, uh, offshore wind uh, turbine uh, reprocessing. Um, 
as part of the onshore wind sector deal, there's an agreement to have a blade remanufacturing site uh, or plant as part of that deal as well. But I remain of the view that placing requirements on the, the bill is not the right approach, uh, in particular the requirement for the report to contain a strategy targets and reporting be too onerous to prepare within the time period set out in Amendment 64. But I, I recognise uh, very much the benefits of such a report may bring in providing a clear and transparent platform for future investment, supporting the just transition, driving forward Scotland's circular economy, and for those reasons I'm happy to undertake a waste reprocessing infrastructure report within one year of royal assent, provided that Amendment 64 is amended uh, by Mark Ruskell's Amendment 64A for the reasons that he set out to remove unduly onerous requirements about a strategy targets and further reporting. Um, so if Amendment 64 is not amended as set out in uh, Amendment 64A, I can't support it, but uh, if it is, then I can. Thank you, Minister. I call Morris uh, Golden to wind up on Amendment 64. Um, happy to press. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Golden. And I call on Mark Ruskell to wind up on Amendment 64A and to press or withdraw. Uh, I think I'll, I'll just press that one. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Ruskell. So the question is that Amendment 64A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Uh, we are not agreed. There will be a division, and members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed. Point of order, Fraser Chowdhury. I think we need Mr Chowdhury's microphone. Oh, uh, sorry, my, my app did not refresh. Can I check if my vote has been... Mr. Chaudhry, your vote has been recorded. Thank you. Thank you. Point of order, Graeme Day. Many thanks, Mr. Uh, my app didn't work. I would have voted yes. Thank you, Mr. Day. Your vote will be recorded. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 64A, in the name of Mark Ruskell, is yes, 64, no, 50. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I now call on Maurice Golden to press or withdraw Amendment 64 as amended. Press. Thank you, Mr Golden. The question is that Amendment 64 as amended be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is agreed. We now turn to Group 15, Deposit and Return Schemes, Power to Direct Scheme Administrator. I call Amendment 92 in the name of the Minister in a group on its own. I call on the Minister to move and to speak to Amendment 92. Minister. Thank you, President Officer. I now turn to Amendment 92 and move Amendment 92, which seeks to amend Section 85 of the Climate Change Scotland Act 2009 in relation to deposit and return scheme. And I couldn't have brought this amendment forward at stage two since we needed to first conclude our discussions with the UK Government and other devolved governments in the interoperability of schemes across the UK. And I note, wrote to the Net Zero Committee ahead of this to let them know that this was a vehicle that I was taking 
uh, here. The amendment seeks to remove the direction making powers given to Scottish ministers in section 85, subsection 4 of the 2009 Act and replace them with a new provision which instead provides a power for Scottish ministers to include the same kind of direction making powers in an order which designates a new body or an existing body as the scheme administrator for any deposit and return scheme. Section 85, subsection 4, as it currently stands, contains a direction making power on the face of the 2009 Act. This leads to a substantial risk of a scheme administrator designated under Section 85 being classified by the Office of National Statistics as a public body because such a direction making power represents potential ministerial control over such a scheme administrator. This amendment would remove that direction making power from the face of the Act but ensures that ministers could still be given a power under Section 85 designation order to give direction to such a scheme administrator. It is therefore still aligned with the original intention of the provisions in the 2009 Act. It means that ministers can in future decide whether it is appropriate in relation to any such scheme administrator whether or not it should be subject to ministerial decision -making power, direction making powers. That decision would be informed by whether the policy intention was for the body to be classified as a public or private sector. This amendment is important in relation to the future development of our DRS for drinks containers, which we continue to work on with the UK Government and other UK nations. The amendment will allow Scottish ministers to consider the use of Section 85 for 2009 Act to designate a body as a scheme administrator for Scotland. The amendment aligns with the intent of the Government and business that our DRS for drinks containers is operated by a private sector body and it mitigates against the risk of public sector classification of any body operating our DRS for drinks containers if ministers choose to designate it under the existing powers in section 85 of the, uh, the 2009 Act. Scotland remains the only part of the UK that has passed regulations for a deposit return scheme for drinks containers. I am confident that our DRS could have operated along UK schemes, but we are now at the point where we are working with other UK governments on an interoperable scheme. And I hope to have that concluded when we have a new UK government in place. Thank you, Minister. Uh, I note that no other members have sought to speak, and therefore I would ask whether the Minister has anything further that she would wish to add by way of wind-up. No, that's me. Thank you, Minister. The question is that Amendment 92 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is agreed. That ends consideration of amendments. I am minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 11.2.4 of Standing Orders that uh, decision time be brought forward to now. I invite the Minister for Parliamentary Business, Jamie Hepburn, to move the motion. Move, President Officer. Thank you, Minister. The question is that decision time be brought forward to now. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. In fact, there are no questions to be put as a result of today's business. That concludes decision time, and I close this meeting.